My ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal. These words were spoken by one of the greatest presidents our country has ever had. On the 12th day of February in the year 1809, a baby boy came into the world in a small log cabin near Hodgeville, Kentucky. His proud father, Tom Lincoln, looked at his new son and said, Nancy, let's name him Abraham after my father, Abraham. He was a good man. That's a good name, Tom. Belonged to a great leader, too. Abraham in the Bible. Who knows? Maybe our little Abe will be a great leader. Well, first of all, he's going to have to grow up and help me on the farm. Little Abe's got a long road to hoe before he'll have time to lead anybody. Tom Lincoln was a poor man and uneducated. All he knew how to do was to work his farm in order to keep his wife, Nancy, and his two children, Sally and Abe, alive. Then one day, Tom Lincoln came home and he announced, Nancy, I've sold the farm. You've sold a farm? Where are we going to live? In Indiana. Indiana? Tom, are you taking a leave of your senses? That must be a hundred miles away. Nancy, I heard there's rich farmland there and you can buy it for $2 an acre. Come on now, we got to start packing. I want us out of here before the cold weather sets in. When the Lincolns arrived at Pigeon Creek in Indiana, there was a lot of work to do. Little Abe worked side by side with his father, chopping down the tall trees, and then they set about building a log cabin. It was only one room, and it didn't have any windows. The floor was dirt, and there were no beds, just piles of dry leaves to sleep on. But Nancy was so happy to be living in a real house, and she didn't mind working by candlelight all day long. So the Lincolns passed their first year in Indiana. But then a plague came to Pigeon Creek and afflicted many settlers. It was called the milk sickness. Abe's mother come down with it bad, and since there was no doctor nor medicine anywhere around, Nancy Lincoln died. The bottom fell out of Abe's world. He had loved his mother so much. Tom Lincoln and his children tried to keep house and cook and tend the farm, but as the days and weeks went by, their faces grew thinner, their clothes shabbier, and the cabin dirtier. Then one morning, Tom Lincoln took off for a few days, and when he returned, he was sitting in a wagon drawn by four horses. Beside him sat a smiling woman holding a small boy in her lap, and behind her stood two young girls. As they grew closer, Tom Lincoln shouted, Whoa, there! Well, here we are, Sari. Abe, Sally, I brought you a new ma and some brothers and sisters, too. Here, Sari, let, let me help you down. Oh, thank you. This is your new home and family. Well, I declare. Y'all look as though you haven't had a bite to eat since Christmas. Think the best thing we better do now is get some vittles ready, and I'm sure everybody feel better. Come on now, everybody. There's work to do. Abe and Sally's new mother was someone Tom Lincoln had known in Kentucky. Her husband had died, and so he had gone to find out if she would come and be a mother to his two children. Sarah was pleased to find a new life for herself. So they were married, and their two families come together. Sarah Lincoln was a good mother. She kept the house clean and lively. Best of all... Sarah Lincoln discovered the brightness in Abraham and knew he should be getting some schooling. But Abe's father said, Schooling's silly and a waste of time, and Abe should spend his time with his chores on the farm. But Sarah went out, and Abe went to school. Eight miles away. Well, books were hard come by, but he read everything he could get his hands on. The Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, Aesop's Fables... That is, when he wasn't working in the fields or in the woods. He learned to handle all kinds of tools, and his body was grown tall and strong. Oh, he was the best wrestler in town. Won all the running contests, broad jumps, and could pitch a crowbar further than anyone around. By the time he was 17, he had learned a lot, 
and he'd grown to be six feet four inches tall. He began to work for other farmers in the neighborhood and gave his father his wages. Everyone liked him because he was a conscientious worker and he was full of wit and good humor. And then the school he'd been attending several weeks during each year came to an end. Abraham was asked to read a speech at the closing exercises. Afterwards, he and his stepmother walked home together. Sarah said... Oh, I was right proud of you today, Abe. I declare, what's ailing you? You look mighty down in the mouth for a boy who spoke his piece so well on the last day. I've been thinking how this is the last day I'll ever go to school, most likely. And I ain't even had a year of schooling all told. I can't even speak proper. Seems to me like you're giving yourself a mighty fine education with all them books you keep reading. Ma, that's the whole trouble. I've read every book for miles around. I've been thinking about going away. Going away? Well, where would you go? Well, any place where I could meet new people and find new books. I can't help it, Ma. I want to get away. It wasn't long before Abe got his chance to get away. One of the farmers he worked for hired him to help him on a flatboat taking a cargo down to New Orleans. To a boy brought up in the backwoods, it was a real adventure to sail 700 miles down the Mississippi River. New Orleans was the first big city he'd ever seen. And Abe's eyes grew wide and his mouth fell open as he gawked at ladies and gentlemen in fancy clothes. And for the first time in his life, he saw Negroes in chains being sold in the slave market. Abe could not believe that human beings were actually sold like cattle. And this sight and this feeling stayed with him the rest of his life. When he returned to Pigeon Creek, Abe learned that his family was leaving Indiana and moving further west to Illinois, a new frontier, out of the woods and on to the prairies. Not long after they had settled in Illinois, Abe met a man who wanted to hire him as a clerk in his store in New Salem. His father didn't like the idea, but Abe was 21 now and on his own. The morning he left, he said goodbye to his family, and then his stepmother walked down to the gate with him. He looked at her for a long time, tenderly. You just believe in yourself, Abe. God bless you. Abe kissed her quickly and ran down the road toward his new life in New Salem. Abe went to work in Mr. Offutt's store, selling everything from ladies' hats and coats to sugar, tea, and coffee. The townspeople were quite awed by this long and lanky backwoodsman who could actually write his name, <laughs> which none of them could do. They were drawn to his good humor and the stories and the jokes he always had ready. He was also admired and respected for his honesty and integrity. In those first years in New Salem, Abe went to war against the Indians, he came back and became postmaster. He worked as a land surveyor, and he was elected to the legislature. Honest Abe, his friends called him. He opened a store of his own in New Salem, and one day a farmer drove up in a loaded wagon. He came into the store, and he said, Hey there, young man. We're moving out, and we're so crowded, I gotta get rid of this barrel. Give me 50 cents, and you can have it. <laughs> I'll pay you 50 cents for it, mister. The barrel turned out to be a treasure chest for Abe Lincoln because down in the bottom, he found a big, thick book called Blackstone's Commentaries, the most important law book ever printed. That first day, Abe read 40 pages of it. Then he remembered a Major John Stewart that he had met in the Indian War who had said to him, You're a bright young man. If you ever want to be a lawyer, come to Springfield. I need a partner. Abe wrote to Major Stewart and told him he had begun to study law. The Major sent him more books to read, and Abe went on studying in his spare time. When the time came for him to take the examination, he passed it with flying colors. Abraham Lincoln was now a lawyer. He gave up his store in New Salem, and he went on to Springfield. Major Stewart kept his promise, and he took him into his law office as a partner. Springfield, Illinois was full of bright young men and women all interested in the political issues of the day. There were teas and parties and dances, and for the first time in his life, 
Abe was associated with people of culture, wealth, and education. But he was living in an attic over Josh Speed's store, and for a long time he was in debt. But he was building a fine reputation for himself. People in Springfield were saying, If you want a good lawyer, get Abe Lincoln. He's smart and he's honest. Meanwhile, a young lady named Mary Todd had come to Springfield to live. She came from a very wealthy and important family in Kentucky. She was very pretty and very well educated. Abe was a little afraid of her, but one evening they were both invited to the same party, and he finally summoned up enough courage to go up to her. Well, Miss Todd, excuse me. I would like to dance with you in the worst way. Why, Mr. Lincoln, I'd be delighted. Abe swept Mary Todd around the dance floor. He stepped all over her feet, bumped into other couples, and held her hand up like a flagpole. <laughs> Finally, the music stopped. Mr. Lincoln, you said you wanted to dance with me in the worst way? You have accomplished that desire. <laughs> But it didn't matter to Mary Todd whether Abe Lincoln could dance or not. She fell in love with him, and he with her. And the following year, they were married. In 1846, Abe was elected a member of the United States Congress in Washington. Then he came back to his law practice in Springfield. Long about now, there were three lively boys romping around the comfortable big house he had bought for his family. They'd lost their son, Eddie, when he was a baby. Now Robert was 11, Willie was four, and Tad was a little fella. Abe adored his boys and spent as much time as he could with them. But now he seemed to be losing his interest in politics. But then something happened that changed his whole life, and the history of our country, too. People were moving west and forming new states now. Stephen A. Douglas, an old friend of Abe's and Mary's, who was now a senator in Washington, wanted a new law to make it possible for the people in each state to own slaves. Well, Abe Lincoln was outraged. He got on his horse and he traveled all over Illinois making speeches. Slavery must be kept out of territory that was still free, he said. It is wrong for one man to own another. Terribly wrong. If a Negro is a man, then my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal. Abe Lincoln was nominated for United States Senator and ran against Stephen A. Douglas. Never was there a more exciting campaign. A series of debates was held in seven different towns. The two candidates, Douglas, who was called the Little Giant, and old Abe, the Giant Killer, <laughs> argued about slavery. People came from miles around to hear him. Finally, the elections came. Stephen A. Douglas won. Afterwards, Abe said to a friend, I feel like the boy who stubbed his toe. It hurts too bad to laugh, and I'm too big to cry. But the part Abe took in the Lincoln-Douglas debates made his name known throughout the country. And in 1860, he was nominated for President of the United States on the Republican ticket. Again, Stephen A. Douglas was his opposing candidate. All over the states that were opposed to slavery, people were campaigning for Abraham Lincoln. Everywhere they were singing. But in the South, those who had worked for slavery were jubilant and confident that their candidate, Douglas, was sure to win. At last, Election Day, November 6, 1860, arrived. All through the nation, voters were coming out in the largest numbers ever. Springfield was wild with excitement. Abe and Mary were with friends across the street from the telegraph office when a messenger rushed in. Abraham Lincoln is the next president of the United States. The country was in need of a strong and brave president in 1861. Civil war broke out, and American soldiers were fighting each other. The North, believing slavery was wrong, 
and the southern states wanted to break away and govern themselves. The White House was always full of government officials and military officers and endless crowds of visitors. Abe Lincoln handled all the state and military affairs with great calm and control. But more and more, his face was showing his inner suffering and anxiety. One of the biggest battles fought was on a field in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was turned into a national military cemetery and the president was asked to make a few remarks at the dedication ceremonies. He spoke only a few minutes, but his words have remained with American people for over a hundred years. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And the president ended his speech with these memorable words. That government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln was elected to a second term of the presidency in 1864. Finally, in 1865, the Civil War was over. It had lasted four long years. President Lincoln signed the order that made the slaves in the South free. Now all the states were united again. The Union was saved. But hundreds of thousands of American lives had been lost. The Lincolns, too, had lost their 12-year-old son, Willie, to typhoid fever. Now only Robert and Ted were left. All the tragedies of the war and the loss of his own sons had left deep lines in Abe's face and a sadness in his eyes that never went away. But now the war was over, and one night in April, some old friends insisted that he and Mary forget their troubles and go to Ford's Theater to see a comedy called Our American Cousin. All the people in the theater cheered when they came into their bar. <laughs> they sat down. The curtain went up. The play began. The audience was quiet. Then, all of a sudden, a shot rang out. The president slumped over in his chair. A man with a pistol leaped from the box to the stage, shouting, Sex to put Tyrannus! And he escaped. By morning, Abraham Lincoln was dead. If you were to go to Washington, D.C., as hundreds of thousands of people do, you would visit the magnificent memorial to President Lincoln there. And you would see the fine statue of this great president sitting in his chair, looking down upon all who come to view him. And in his face, you would see the same deep kindness and understanding that Abraham Lincoln had shown all people when he lived.